The next speaker is Matthew Machuga, who's been around the Laravel community for uh, a while, actually, four or five years probably, a long time. And uh, he is a developer at Think Through Math, and he's going to be talking to us about testing. So let's hear it from Matt. I was trying to find water bottle and stuff. I'm gonna steal another one. Okay, so before I start the actual talk, I just wanted to um, kind of address something right quick. Maybe. Okay, so the community today and yesterday has been great. Everyone's super friendly, everyone's getting along. There's a lot of really great conversations happening. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple things to help improve the, uh, the conference experience that were said to me at my first conference. Um, a guy named Corey Haynes came out and kind of spent a half hour talking about how you can uh, get everything you can out of a conference. So I've made a list of goals for everyone. Um, I'd like it if you could try to follow them. There's obviously no obligation, but I think it'll help out. So the first one, I want you to try to meet at least five new people. It's pretty easy because there's about 600 people here, so you can just walk up, say hi. Um, there's different social levels with a, or different social comfort levels, and we definitely understand that. So if you see somebody wandering nearby, please invite them into your conversation. Um, they might just be like kind of hovering around, unsure of how to join. Just reach out, grab them in, say, "Hey, you got something to add to this?" Um, if you're that person who's wandering nearby. See if you can just jump in. Um, nothing bad's gonna happen. It's perfectly fine. Um, I'd like you to talk to at least one speaker. We are just like you. There's no difference. No speaker's gonna get mad at you for coming up and talking to them. And we would actually love to hear your feedback. So please don't be afraid to do that. Um, thank at least one organizer or sponsor. There's a lot of work that goes into this stuff, so um, them hearing your positive feedback or any like concerns or questions you have for them, they'd really like that. And please join at least one of these things to join more of the Laravel community if you haven't already. Um, is anybody part of this? Lara, Chad, or IRC? Good number. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled talk. So stories have dictated our entire human history. Um, ever since we could write on cave walls or inscribe on papyrus or anything like that, we've been writing down our story and new stories to tell future generations um, how we came to be. We tell stories for a number of reasons, whether that is to convey a meaning, to teach morals, to entertain, um, to dissuade, to maybe some malicious purpose. but. We tell stories all the time, and from the time that we're babies, we love them. You can watch children attached to TV shows. Um, if a speaker tells a story in their talk, that usually goes over well. I think I forgot to do that in mine, so we'll see what happens. Um, does anybody know who this is? Okay. So for those who don't know, this is Fred Rogers. Um, he's the host and creator of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Uh, in my opinion, he's one of the greatest storytellers who've ever come to be. He brought us into his neighborhood, made us his neighbors. He taught kids how to uh, feel loved, how to feel special, how to deal with difficult situations. Some days he would just take them on a tour of a crayon factory. Um, really awesome stuff. Sadly, he passed away in 2003 from stomach cancer, but his legend lives on. Um, the, the Fred Rogers Company has made Daniel's Tiger's Neighborhood, and it takes place in the neighborhood of make-believe with all of the same characters, um, along with their children. So it's kind of like a nice progression. If you have kids now, I'm sure that you've seen this at some point in time. Um, I recommend it. I like it. I learn things from it. It's pretty cool. But one of my reasons for this is that Fred Rogers has had a number of great quotes over the years, and I especially like this one. He says, we live in a world where we need to share responsibilities. It's easy to say it's not my problem, it's not my child, it's not my community. And then there's those who see the need and respond. I consider those people my heroes. 
I definitely agree with this. Um, for everybody who steps up in the community and is willing to write a tutorial, write a blog post, help somebody out in IRC, help somebody out in Layer Chat, you're all contributing to something that makes the greater good a wonderful place to be. Um, Mr. Rogers started Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood because he watched some television and he decided he hated the content on it. He did not like television at all, but he understood the greatness that could come from that medium. And that kind of sounds like someone else in our community, and that's Taylor Otwell. There, thank you. So Taylor often says when he was building Laravel, he didn't like what he saw. Um, he tried out a few things. He tried to bring over some concepts from .NET, um, join them together with Ruby, and slowly but surely, five years ago, Laravel was pieced together and like built up to what it is today. Um, that's something I've been fortunate enough to watch, and like it's been a really fun ride. So uh, I think it's seven Laracons now. The eighth one is next month. Um, a huge community. We're doing pretty well. So. What I'm trying to say is that Taylor is pretty much PHP's Mr. Rogers. <laughs> if Mr. Rogers drove a Zonda, had some haters, you know, good stuff. <laughs> I, worked, I worked an embarrassingly hard time on that. Like, it took me a while. <laughs> OK, so uh, to kick it off, your code tells a story whether you intended to or not. Uh, the reader of your code should be able to look at it and understand what you're trying to do. They should be able to watch the flow of information travel through your objects and through your functions and kind of get the idea of what your intent was. This is a list of books that I highly recommend, um, with the exception of SICP down there, bottom row, third in. A lot of them will cover testing and um, good software practices. Um, SICP is like ground level, so they don't exactly cover testing, but um, they all distill to roughly the same meanings. They try to put out good naming, uh, good abstractions. They push the details down to lower levels so you can understand your API at a high level and uh, make it more understandable as levels go down. Having your intent clearly expressed is super important for other humans. It's super important for you six months later. It's important for me 10 minutes later when I forgot what I was doing. Um, we just kind of skipped over the test driven mostly because that is a key point, but I don't want that to be the takeaway from the talk. Yet, at least. So um, these questions effectively come down to who are the characters? Who's the subject and the supporting characters? And those are typically your current object who is doing the action and the collaborators that help them out. Um, what's the setting? How's your environment set up? What's the plot? What is the goal of your current system? That could be a module, that could be a class, that could be anything. Um, what's the conflict? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? And then what's your resolution? The thing with stories is that they're not just told, they're interpreted. Um, if you think of a song that you really like, you have some idea of what the meaning of that song is. You might not really know, the artists don't tend to reveal what the meaning of the song is. But if you ask the person next to you what they think the song means, it's probably gonna be at least a little bit different or very different. Um, and there's always that guy who's like, that song's about drugs. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so there's this band that I really like. Um, they're really popular in my teens. They're called Coheed and Cambria. And they have, thank, I'm glad people know who they are. That's awesome. Um, they've made some incredibly epic songs over the years. Like the average runtime of their music is about seven minutes. Um, it goes through um, some really complicated melodies, a lot of guitar stuff, really cool. So amongst their incredible lyrics, there's one that stands out, and that is, I need mayo. <laughs> this is an example of something that seems ridiculous, but it has a, a deeper meaning. And that deeper meaning is not anything like um, directly related to like, their lives. It's about a story. Mayo is a character in their um, long-running graphic novel, and it's from one of his sergeants effectively saying, I need mayo to do something. But um, they actually cut this out of the album listing, when album listings were a thing, when you bought CDs. 
Um, they left this line out of it because the record label thought it was ridiculous, so they refused to print it. But there's meaning behind it. People could still hear it. Um, it kind of went on, and then online lyrics became a thing, so it's everywhere. Um, and then there's other times where interpretations can be done differently. So what do you see here, except for a terrible pun with the title that I apologize, but I couldn't rephrase that? Uh, some people see it as the lens through which we view media, the lens that they put over our eyes. Other people might view it as, um, I don't know. What do you see? I don't know. I can't find my glass. That's a good one. This one boils down to about nothing. Some guy just put his glasses on the ground and uh, waited to see what happened. <laughs> I really like this guy right here. He's super into it. So even the little things in your code, people will take very seriously sometimes. You'll even interpret it differently. So here are some cognitive concerns to consider when you're writing code, or these even apply if you're just talking to someone, giving a code review, uh, pretty much any situation. It's good to keep these things in mind. Um, Taylor asked for like a poll of different countries that people have been to. This is a great thing to apply. Um, this is something they taught in our systems analysis class in university. Um, I found it really beneficial because it kind of makes you think about how you're conveying information to someone. Um, some slang or an idea that might not be known to someone else, you have to try to convey it as clearly as possible and with as little ambiguity as possible. Or you run into situations like this. Um, I know that gifts everywhere, I just love it. Um, and it's, it's a little absurd, but like this is how your users could be using your API. <laughs> so you're staring at them, you're like, uh, all right. Um, but your API could be ambiguous. Something that you find clear, if they're coming from a different language, it might be totally different. Um, in Ruby, we have, it's not an exact definition of it, but we have an a exclamation point at the end of some methods, and that's typically how you say that a method is destructive, that it's gonna change the object it's operating on. PHP doesn't have that, so sometimes when I jump back and forth, I get a little confused at what's gonna do what to my array. Um, and here, here's a good example. If you have a C CSV library and there's a method on it called read, that could do any of these three things. Maybe it slurps the whole file in, maybe it streams it. Um, in Clojure, it becomes a lazily evaluated uh, vector uh, array. So read might seem super clear when you're the one writing the API, but if you're coming from a different background, that's one of those things you have to go dive in the docs or just wait until your memory performance blows through the roof and you can't read that CSV file later in life. Um, so what I was getting at is ambiguity leads to interpretation rather than conveying the point that you want. Um, I'm gonna pop this quote up for a second. <laughs> I got a PBS theme going if you haven't caught on to that. Um, Bob Ross always used to say this. Uh, there was at least two times when I was watching it that he mentioned it. Um, he says, we don't make mistakes, we have happy accidents. And in art, this is super valid. If you like swipe a line across, you can turn it into a happy little tree. Um, <laughs> even in science, this applies if it's not in production. Um, the memristor that came about, the, the resistor or transistor, is something that can hold its state. That was an accident. They were looking for something different, but they found a memristor, so that's pretty cool. If your stuff is in production, you typically don't want these things to happen. Um, a mistake or an accident could be detrimental. And we're not Bob Ross. Uh, we make mistakes. Now, sometimes these mistakes might lead to a hyperlink being broken, or somebody can't go to their homepage. Um, maybe a financial risk is something that they lose a penny, or maybe it's something totally different. Maybe their business collapses because you've been giving out way too much money, or maybe you've taken too much from their consumers, so they're having bank problems. Um, we have GE in my hometown, where they work on locomotive engines, and they have some really sophisticated testing simulations for both hardware and software. In those situations, people can die if they make bugs, so they take testing very seriously. And I'm not trying to take that in a, a very dark path, but as software developers, it's our jobs to protect our clients and our customers. 
So um, what I want you to take away with that is write tests to prevent happy accidents. And uh, you do write tests, don't you? <laughs> Who writes tests? Please be honest, I'm not actually judging you. Just kidding, I'm judging you. <laughs> This last one, however, this is for Keynote. This happened at least twice when I was making this stuff. So, uh, yeah. But anyway, if you're writing a throwaway project or a script that just does something for you, it's not really public facing, it doesn't control anything heavy, heavy handed, I'm not saying you should literally write tests for everything. Like, you can have your fun, um, or if you have like a marketing site and you're not handling logic, or a project that you can go through and manually test every step of it easily. Automated tests aren't gonna buy you a whole lot in those situations. But if you have a hard, complex situation, definitely something that deals with money or interfaces with hardware like pacemakers, you gotta take that really seriously. And um, I'm not trying to sell you on like immediately switching to testing, that'd be fantastic. But if you could at least kind of consider it and see if you can sway your management towards it, uh, that'd be a great thing. So, tests. Um, let's start off with the anatomy of a test. Adam covered this a little bit yesterday, which was um, really helpful. At the time, I was like, ah, he killed my talk. But um, here's one version of it. This is the four phase. You set up your environment and the preconditions. Then you exercise your method, your object, your function, just whatever the system under test is. Then you can verify your results. And then you gotta tear your environment back down so it's ready to go for the next one. There is, it's kind of a variant. It's kind of a, something that would go along with it. It's called the AAA, and this is what Adam brought up. Arrange, act, assert. You arrange your preconditions and your input. You act on the object or system under test. And then you assert what you expect to happen. The differences between the two are mostly whether it's inline or uh, separate functions. Um, I can cover that in a second. Another way to look at the, the AAA is with given when then. And this is something that if you've written user stories before or you've seen bhat and PHP, this is the syntax that you would use to kind of describe the three situations. And just to set a baseline, before yesterday, who has seen a test that looks like this in any language? Show of hands. If I step back really far, I can actually see you. Okay. Um, at least of yesterday, you've seen some of these. You've seen some examples from Adam. This is known as an X unit test. Um, there's J unit, there's XC unit in Objective C. Um, there's a whole bunch. Pretty much every language has one of these. Uh, the way it looks from the top down, you give your class name a description of what you're trying to test. Sometimes it's just the, the class name regurgitated, other times it might be a little bit more descriptive because you might be describing a behavior. Next, we have the setup function, and this will kind of prepare your environment. And this is what I meant by maybe it's inline, maybe it's out of line. Um, then you declare your test subject. In this case, we're gonna test a, a user repository. The teardown function resets your environment. So assuming this is maybe a database or um, something that has a real persistent storage, we have to clear it back out because the system will just keep adding to it. And this is a pretty common mistake. Like We've done this a few times. Um, I've done it a lot where um, we were using Redis as a test storage, didn't clear it, so I kept getting more records added on and the test got really wonky after a while. Next, you declare a, a method. It starts with test and PHP unit. I'm not sure all of them work that way. But you would describe what you're testing. So in this case, I'm testing that I can find a user by, by name. Then you operate on it, you act, and then you test it with an assertion. In this case, we're asserting that these two are equal. There's another style of test which in PHP, I've seen a couple libraries. Um, it's not super common, but it's kind of known as a spec or a BDD style test. Um, BDD's behavior-driven development. And at a basic level, they're pretty similar. So everything in blue is kind of what I want you to pay attention to here. Not a whole lot of that changed. 
instead of having a class declaration at the top, we use this describe function. And we pass in a string that is the description of what we're testing. So it's just replacing the class name. Next, we have the before each block, which replaces setup. Uh, after each replaces teardown. And then we have this it block, which declares what you're testing at the time. So there I pass in, I can find a user by name. Pretty much exactly as it was. The bigger difference at the bottom, um, the only one that changes in the code block here, is that our assertion turns into an expect. It's still making a type of assertion, you're just kind of doing it in a different way. You're creating an expectation out of this, and then you would call a method on it. Um, in this case, we're just calling to equal, just like we did before. So again, x unit, spec. Not too much to worry about. Uh, so running down here, describe is just a function, and this is handled differently in different languages. But in this case, you pass it a, a function with a string, run through, it's all the same. Um, these style tests support nested context, which is handy if you have some complex scenarios or if you want to group some things together. So let's see, say I added this function down here. Returns null when given an invalid name. If I were to do this in XUnit, it could be slightly longer, where I'd have to say uh, test user repository can return null from find by name. You know, depends on how ver verbose you want to go. I prefer being able to separate these into contexts. Um, and context here is just an alias for describe. It does the same thing. But it yields a test printing like this. Doesn't have to. This is just a, a default. And I find this very, very readable. Um, when I have to show it to stakeholders or project managers, they find this readable. I clean it up a, a little bit, but um, I have a subjective preference to this. Um, some people do, some people prefer XUnit. It really doesn't matter as long as you're testing, but this is what we're going with for now. Um, you write out your tests and sentences. You write out your preconditions and sentences. There's still code there, and we're developers, so we can read code. But sometimes it helps to explain a situation in a way that's more like a story. Um, these other reasons are all valid. The bottom one, I work with these day to day, so I'm more comfortable with presenting a, a complex topic on it this way. So is everybody pretty okay with this? Good with moving forward? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here are the spec libraries we'll be using. Um, they're not PHP. We're gonna be covering Jasmine and RSpec. So since a lot of you yelled out ES6 yesterday, I've made the assumption that I don't have to cover too much on it. Um, the big differences between Ruby and JavaScript in this situation, const defines a variable, um, you just can't redefine it later. We use dot notation instead of arrow syntax. And uh, there's lexical scoping for variables. This is kind of the reason I didn't want to try to translate the slides, because Ruby and JavaScript both have lexical scoping, and Ruby does some magic stuff um, behind the scenes to make it seem that way. So this is kind of how I want to proceed. Our specs differences are pretty minimal. If you see a do and an end, that's just the same as replacing it with a curly brace and a, a closure, effectively. Syntax is optional, so if you don't see parentheses or something, it's just implied. If you see a space and then another word, it's a function call. Um, new is a method on the class rather than a keyword. And then there's what I mentioned earlier with the question mark and the, the bang symbol being part of the syntax, or part of the usable words. I shouldn't say syntax, because that's not true. So, three tips for spec storytelling, or I try these three weird tri tricks on my tests. You'll never guess what happened next. <laughs> Number one, be expressive. Sometimes if you write a custom behavior or a custom action for a complex behavior, you can increase your readability on, ability on a test. So this is an example of a real acceptance test from our test suite. Um, in it, we're describing this concept of an item. We're saying you should be able to drag it into a category. And inside the test block, there's this function call. Drag item to category with text. You pass in text for the item, and you pass in text for the category. And what this will do, 
It'll scan the DOM for an element, and then it will select it if it sees the word Apple in it. It'll select another element if it sees A-F in it. And then it just does, performs a drag operation. So here's kind of an animation of how the UI works. It performs this basic behavior for us. Now, there are a couple nuances at the top that just appear in a second. Check appears as long as the application's in a valid state that allows testing. Um, testing for students, not the unit testing. And next appears if they get it right. So back to the custom action. This is what we start with. And if we decompose it to, uh, to this one, it just breaks down to selecting an item, as I mentioned with the item text, performing the drag to operation, which will just do it on the headless browser. And then we select the category by that text. Now, if we expand these two, this is all that they're made of. Um, this might seem a little silly to you. Like, why would I write helper functions to cover, like, four lines of work? Well, the four lines of work will grow into that. That's still pretty readable. If you double down, and in this case, I want to test that I can pull all of the items out of the uncategorized for those four that I showed you, then we've now moved this to about, what is that, 12-ish? 16 lines of code before you actually hit an action. This is kind of gross. Um, generally, you don't want your first assertion or your first action too far down the page. Um, that's indicative that you're showing too much setup. Um, sometimes, if it's in a unit test, you're probably just doing too much setup. In this case, since there's a lot of DOM manipulation to run the test, this is just part of the game. Um, if we go even further, the first action takes place on the 27th line here. This is getting obnoxious, and in this one, I'm simply putting one item into one category, um, each one respectively. Nope. Your tests are code, so it's okay to refactor them, and you should. If you're doing the red-green refactor cycle, the refactor implies that you're allowed to change your tests as well. You should still make sure they work the right way before you do that, but you are allowed to update them. Um, I also encourage using the best assertion for what you're trying to do. This is a simple one. I'm expecting that if I cast 2 plus 2 to a string, it's going to equal 4. If it does, it's supposed to equal true. This is the feedback that I'm going to get. I get that it expected true and got false. Um, even though it gives us that handy little printout of our assertion at the top, it's still unclear what went wrong. Um, if, you're, if you really only use PHP, this is probably seeming very odd that it's breaking. So if we change the assertion that we're running on it, instead we're going to cast it to a string, and then we're going to assert that it is equal to four. If we run it again, we get a bit more of a broken down uh, piece of information. It expected the numeral four, but it got the string four. Um, in PHP, this would be coerced. The string would just evaluate as true against the numeral four. Um, Ruby is strictly, um, Ruby strongly typed, so this just doesn't fly. Um, and for defining custom assertions, Laravel has a few different ways of doing this. This is some code from uh, somewhere in Laravel Foundation, I think, for the, for the custom tests and specs and assertions that Taylor's written. If you're testing that you can see a header, and that's uh, just something from a response object, if you tested that, if you hit like a get API, like one of your get routes, the response back should be presenting the header that you pass in here. So he runs two assertions to compile this single assertion. He tests that the header is visible, and if not, he prints out that handy header blank is not present on response. If it passes that, if the header exists, if it doesn't match, he gives you a second one. Um, and most X unit things work like this. If you pass a third argument, that third argument is the method that is, or I'm sorry, it's the message that gets brought back to you as your assertion failure. Um, this is kind of the PHP blessed way of doing a custom assertion, and most of PHP unit is built this way. Um, the is true is handled exactly like everything else. There's an assert that that everything's based off of. In our spec, we define a custom matcher like this. We simply define what the actual versus the expected is. In this case, we just do a modulo zero. Um, 
or actual versus whatever, modulode. And then down at the bottom left, we say, I want you to describe the numeral nine. And we expect that nine should be a multiple of four. When that fails, that's the message that we get back. And that's a really helpful message versus just like true equals false. Um, so if you have some form of complex behavior, expanding it to this can really help you in the long run. And you shouldn't go wild with this. Not every assertion should have its own custom setting. But as long as you find the messages helpful when you're doing um, some sort of testing, that's what's going right. Um, this is especially helpful in TDD, where you write the failing test, the failing test tells you what your next step is, and then you can proceed. Um, I think PHP spec was big on hinting this, but. Step two, respect the cukes. Um, cucumber. Has anybody used Cucumber or Behat? That's awesome. Um, Cucumber was like the hotness in Rails in like 2010, 2011. And people would write out their user stories pretty much in English. So um, this is an example. I swapped it out with this this morning. If I'm trying to get layer con attendees to test their code, I would write out the user story. In order to convince layer, ton, layer con attendees to test their code, as a speaker, I want to provide helpful information and entertainment. Then you break down the scenario, and this is where given when then comes back. Assuming that Adam Wathen gives a talk on TDD prior to mine, given that the attendees recently saw his talk, and I was in the audience, when I go to give my talk, then I can make some assumptions on what the attendees know, and I can weep as I rearrange my slide deck. <laughs> if we break this down into RSpec style tests, we can use some nested context here to build out. And it translates roughly the same way. So we're going to describe convincing Lyricon attendees, et cetera. Then we describe giving a talk as a speaker. The context is that Adam gave his talk before me. And then we have the two tests that we're going to write assertions for. It can make some assumptions on what attendees know, and it can weep while rearranging the slide deck. Once we declare our test subject as myself, then we're kind of good to go. Um, and this is why I chose subject earlier. In RSpec, there's a magical subject function that you're supposed to use and it'll lazily evaluate. Um, and it's supposed to denote what your test subject is in all of your tests. It's not required. You could give everything its own unique name. But I like subject because it draws your eye to it. If you know you're looking for subject, you can identify the object under test quickly and effectively every time. And a lot of this stems from behavior-driven development. And this talk is honestly kind of a thinly veiled argument on why behavior-driven development's a good thing. It's used to describe designing an application as it would appear to the stakeholder. Um, you're supposed to talk to the, the stakeholder. You communicate person-to-person um, -person contact. It's a really good thing. Um, there's always that stereotype that we're locked in our closets typing away furiously, hacking the planet. Um, but realistically, our jobs are extremely social these days. And when we're building the software, we need to ask the stakeholder questions. If they say, I need this done today, you say, that was a terrible example. Say, I need a job to run every day. You say, what does a day mean? Does a day mean a nightly job? Does it mean it runs a couple times a day? Um, does it mean it runs exactly at 12 o'clock uh, on UTC? So, it's very focused around the concepts of the Agile Manifesto. Individuals and in actions, or interactions, working software, customer collaboration, and responding to change. The individuals and interactions is one that we instinctively try to automate away. We try to automate everything. Um, our QA team and our DevOps team are excellent at automating, but them more than anyone else value communication between humans. And sometimes we need them to remind us at work that you can't automate everything away. If you talk to somebody, you could save yourself hours of debugging, hours of confusion, and some very angry customers. Number three, bad stories are signals. Here are some smells of bad stories. Plot holes, lack of character development, no descriptions, or switching narratives. If you have a plot hole, you could be mocking the object under test. Do not do this. 
you wind up testing nothing real. Um, sometimes it's not obvious you're doing it. If you say, well, I'm going to mock this function away because method A calls method B. So I'll just mock method B. Eventually, this winds up with you not testing a substantial piece of code. Um, you'll forget to change that mock later, or your function that you're being uh, tucked away, maybe that behavior changes, so your assertion is no longer true. If you do global state mutations outside of your visible uh, viewport into your test, maybe you run something where ahead of time you pre-populate 1,000 records into your database, then you test those 1,000 records. Sometimes this is necessary, but you need some sort of indicator that fixtures are being run. Um, in Rails, we kind of have the, it's understood that as long as you don't change your default uh, settings, that fixtures can be brought into the test suite. Um, as long as your company is OK with this, then it works. We explicitly build all of our test uh, mocks as factories. Um, it just means like we generate them on the fly as we need them. It's not the fastest thing, but it's explicit. And some of our logic gets super confusing if you don't see everything right up front. Um, implicit behavior. If something is implied, it's not explicitly written down. Again, this leads to ambiguities. This can lead to a plot hole. You don't understand how someone got from A to B. Uh, no descriptions. If you create an abstraction, that provides no benefits. Uh, earlier, I was making functions that help me do some sort of custom action. If you're performing an operation that there's no reason for you to be wrapping it, then this is just an extra layer of indirection. If it can be explicitly written out cleanly, that's generally preferred. Um, if you don't provide a or an explanation of why your environment's in the current state, you can't get a feel of what the story is trying to tell you. Um, it's just like bland, the world's empty, you don't care that, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a movie that came out recently, can't think of anything. Intergalactic. What would intergalactic be if they're just like, yeah, they went to a planet through some wormhole and there was a black hole involved and stuff happened? The end. It doesn't tell you anything, it takes all the magic and wonder out of the movie. The lack of character development. You're going to see a little bit more of this in a bit, but if you mock collaborators without a clear reason, and what I mean by that is if you mock an object that could work standalone or a function that could work standalone, you're taking a layer of reality out. Um, you're probably also slowing your test down a little bit. Um, if you perform a transformation on your characters outside of you. So this would be if, um, if you're trying to develop a character and they just disappear for six months and pop back, and all of their internal conflict is resolved, there's no story there. If you can uh, create your characters, develop them inside of your test, then you have that context when you're going to debug, or when you come back to the test to try to understand what this feature is doing. And then switching narratives. Um, setting expectations on collaborators. Adam demonstrated this yesterday where um, you can say that you expect something to do something else. And he demonstrated how it has to be out of order. Uh, that's, you're kind of testing something else at that point. If it's your object under test, fine, but sometimes those messages aren't what's really important. Um, and then if you blur the line between suites, if inside of your unit test folder, you start accessing something through the browser, that's gonna confuse the heck out of somebody later. Uh, number four. Unit test in isolation. This is argued about whether a unit test means in isolation, so we're just going to ignore this for now. Number five, try test-driven development or behavior-driven development. Just give yourself two weeks. Two weeks isn't enough to know whether it's providing a huge tangible benefit, but it's enough to start seeing these little wins add up. And you will be a little slower at first. There's pretty much no avoiding that. It's like if you go from using Sublime to Vim or Emacs, you have a learning curve and a giant hill that you have to go up. Um, even switching to something like PHP Storm, there's a learning curve there. Just give yourself a little bit of time, take it seriously, use it on some uh, play projects first, and then try to take it to work and see if you can build up from there. Um, try to go feature first. Build only what your client needs at that moment. 
This scales really well with uh, slice plans, where if you build a feature during a sprint or something, you would build it from the top down. You'd build the UI, the database, the interactions, everything. Just enough to get that specific feature working, even if it's not complete. Um, the idea is you don't just build the database layer, one iteration, the view layer, next iteration, because you're not delivering anything to the client to test. So uh, using this, you'll waste very few resources trying to test out an idea for your client. If you are working with startups, this is very important. If you're working with an established company and you're testing out um, some new feature just to see if you want to ship it, this is important for them to gather feedback. You can start gathering metrics on whether users are taking advantage of it, whether they're ignoring it, whether they love it, hate it. Um, you can get this feedback from the, the stakeholders. They can take a look at your tests. They can take a look at the information and see if they agree. And this encourages collaboration between teams. Um, recently at work, our, our engineering team and our content team merged together to make uh, a united product team. And this is based on the fact that we work extremely well together and our products get better if we collaborate directly. Um, the last time we did several years ago is like a full team matchup. We created this wonderful lesson player for students to use to complete problems. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so driving your design and code. If you can write a failing test first, you have evidence that the feature is incomplete. And you know that it's not accidentally working. If you write a small amount of code to make that work, then you have evidence that the necessary code to solve that use case is implemented. And if you listen to the feedback from your tests and you refactor it in tests in, piece, or in pieces, then you have confidence that you didn't break anything, at least at a significant level. And it can help you go towards a better design. Because from that point, you're taking the perspective of somebody using the API before you've written it. Um, Taylor used to say that he would just mess with APIs. He wouldn't actually write the code. He would just see how he liked the functions to flow together. And considering there's about 600 of you here, I think it's worked out pretty well for him. So I, I highly encourage it. And then taking small steps ensures you have a save point to go back to really soon. So unlike the original Mario Brothers, where if you died, you had to go back to the start after you gave up your three lives, now everybody has save points. So if you died, you come back like maybe 20 kilometers back from where you started and the equivalents of the game. So time for a story. There's math ahead. Um, I work for a math company. That's, yeah. So I work for Think Through Math. Um, we have 100 or so employees. Our engineering team is comprised of about 16-ish people right now. Um, we develop an LMS where each school year we get about 3 million students signed up. We have about 2 million live help sessions, which I'm going to show you what this system looks like in a little bit. And we have over a billion math problems solved. Um, the shirt says 1.4 billion, and like that number was mind-boggling to me. That's a, it's a lot of math. Um, we have about the same quantity of math problems as Khan Academy does, if that helps put anything into perspective. And it's comprised of a giant Rails monolith and two single-page applications. This is the lesson player that we teamed up to write earlier. This is a multiple choice problem. Um, students would come in here, click on a, a problem, click check to see if they got it right. If they did, the next button in the top right corner would light up and they can proceed to the next one. The live help application helps students who sit in the office or work from home, that, or are teachers that do, they can help the students out over voice, text, or using a digital whiteboard. Um, we take helping our kids really, really seriously, and this helps them out a lot. It provides a whole lot of value to them. Um, this is an example of what it would look like. There's a, a bit of a notice from the server there. In this case, we're displaying that they support WebRTC audio. And then uh, the teacher comes in and says, hey, I'm going to look over your problem. Do you prefer me to talk with voice or text? If their computers don't have audio, it's obviously going to be text. Um, this is the whiteboard that pops up. They can draw these pictures, and I actually bugged one of the teachers like late at night so I wasn't disrupting the whole workflow, but she drew this picture out for me like I'm a, a, one, a first grader. So hopefully that was entertaining. Um, yeah. So this was originally written in Flash. 
It was reimagined and rewritten in 2013. Um, there were some really big goals for this rewrite. We had a wait time of about two minutes, and it was usually past the two minute mark, where students could not get through to a teacher. And instead of being a human problem entirely, it was largely a technological, uh, technological problem. Um, another big goal was that we wanted to work on an iPad. Flash doesn't do that, so we had to give it a rewrite. And we wanted to Im improve the performance and maintainability. The Flash server tended to die a lot. Nobody knew how to fix the Flash server. So if it did, it was just a reboot and, you know, fingers crossed, let's, let's see how this works out. Um, and then we wanted bearing, better pairing of teachers and students. So we rewrote in CoffeeScript and Angular. I just looked at the time, so I'm going to move past a lot of this. But uh, we got the throughput bump to the current level of 2 million per year. They usually wait less than 15 seconds, and it is compatible with iPad. Um, it was left largely untouched until 2015. It just kind of functioned. Um, we compiled all the CoffeeScript to JavaScript, and we simplified the server side to give the performance an extra little boost. So we have a pairing algorithm. You'll get this little timer up here, and it lets the student know that they're sitting in the queue. It's a time-based algorithm, and it grows linearly over time. And I've simplified a few of these things, but um, this is the gist of it, and none of the math characteristics have been skewed, so it, it pretty much works this way. Um, whoever waits longest gets selected first. You get a bonus if, you're in, if you speak the same language as the teacher. So if there's a Spanish-speaking student and we have a Spanish-speaking teacher online, they're most likely to get matched up uh, pretty quick. Um, the offset becomes zero after a certain time because we want the students to get through the queue as fast as possible. And then there's this fast pass thing, which you can ignore for probably like five minutes here. But if you get that, you're guaranteed to win. This is what it breaks down to um, over time. If you have the bonus, you get that extra boost. You grow a little bit slower over time. And at the threshold, you grow at the same speed as everyone else. So here's a given one then. I'm going to skip over reading it because of time. But in this situation, if you selected a student right here, the Spanish-speaking student will win if the teacher speaks Spanish as well. 20 seconds in, it won't matter if you speak the same language, because we need to get you through the queue so the English wins. So we had these specs, and this is what it compiled down to directly from CoffeeScript. And this was like hell to look at, so I cleaned it up a little bit. Um, let's kind of look through it real quick. We have a scoring order for Spanish-speaking students. These are our actors, or our characters. I have no idea what language the student speaks. I don't know why I added this helper a couple years ago, but that was a whoops on my part. Um, but this did default to English. This is the test subject. And we're testing that they will prefer a Spanish-speaking student. Then we have this offset student times. What does it do? This method's in there somewhere, but I couldn't find it for a little bit. Um, it pretty much sets their times up so it skews them in a way that we can test. Uh, here we pull out a student, then we have this magical function that removes a student from the queue, which has already been passed to that test subject. So we're modifying something out from under the object that already has it. So we're mutating an array. Then we pull the second one. And then we assert that the first two students will be Spanish speaking. This is the way that the old story read. And this is how it would tell in the form of story. Here's the prologue, the characters, the protagonist, the plot, the M. Night Shyamalan twist. <laughs> Not like Sixth Sense, it's like the lady in the water, like that really weird one where there's a guy with one buff arm, the other one's like a stick. Um, this is the conflict. Here's a plot hole. I think I highlighted the wrong line there. The remove students, the plot hole. Why is that in there? Here we break down the fourth wall. Um, this is our test interacting with uh, the object under test. Oh, crap. <laughs> Moving right along. Here's our resolution. The good things about this spec we have a mostly clear name for the example, the example group. We are using this, which in Jasmine is a disposable context, so everything gets cleaned up for us. 
and then the assertion matches the description. The not so good things, the helper causes side effects. Our object under test has a dependency that's mutated after it's passed in. Um, our character development happens off screen. And the expectations are dependent on the results of the side effects. We, we also have the three methods of creating a student. But the test passed, the Spanish is uh, pulled first. In the new story, I'm stating things more explicitly. I list out what the wait times of each student is, and then I state the explicit winner at the bottom. So rewritten, the prologue is now described as such, a teacher speaking the same language as a student. There's the character development right in line. This is the chosen one. Here's the plot. It'll pick the student waiting longest. There's the conflict in a single line now. And here's the resolution. But the tests fail. I expected Spanish student one to wait because they were, or student two to win because they've been waiting the longest. They've been waiting for two seconds. Instead, Spanish student one waited, uh, won the, the thing there. So 1,000 is now greater than 2,000. And I'm staring at this thing like, how did this break? I didn't change anything, I just changed the way I stated my assertion. But sure enough, I changed it in the old suite, and it failed. So a wild bug appears. This is what actually happened. Um, these spreadsheet graphs are terrible, but this is what I put into the pull request itself, so I kind of clipped it out. Um, the language score decreased over time until it hit that magical threshold, and then everything was fine. And this is the way that it should have looked. So what did we do about it? Hack the planet. Yeah, I fixed it. I lied about the feature. I said, this is waiting the shortest. So I described what actually happened, but it didn't fix the behavior. But in all fairness, we annotated it. We said, we'll come back to it. <laughs> yeah, really, I did it. Uh, my parent and I were just like, eh, OK. So we went and talked to the stakeholders. We asked them what they wanted to do. They said they wanted to punt. We'll fix it eventually, but it's been like this for almost three years, so it's fine. So my pair uh, CG created this ticket, and we waited till about January. And since we're a Pittsburgh company, on the punt return, yeah! <laughs> Here's another angle. This is great. So. I found the bug, there's nothing magical here. I just fudged some math. And this is ironic because I work for a math company. Um, I fixed the calculation, I reverted that hack in the spec, and the test passed. However, there was an acceptance test that broke somewhere else. And the language should not have played a part in any of this. So like any rational human, I blamed JavaScript. Um, <laughs> so I took the red pill went down the rabbit hole, went debugging. And in this test, I had an English-speaking student and an English-speaking teacher. I enqueued a first uh, Spanish-speaking student. Oh, God, I'm screwing up languages. Everybody spoke English. That's the takeaway here. There was a first one. I waited till uh, a couple seconds later. I enqueued another student who had fast pass, which if you remember, that's just a guaranteed win. There is no way you can lose this. But we lost. Um, there was a test fixture that just wasn't being set correctly, so I'm like, oh, great. Um, I'll patch that. It broke again. Somehow in the serialization and the deserialization, uh, it wasn't being set to the right location, which if I was using a statically uh, typed and statically compiled language, the compiler would have caught it for me. But it's not the situation. Um, TDD also would have caught this. But this was winning only because um, the earlier bug hid the real behavior. It was documented as working the other way than it was working. So if we put the FastPass student last, they were going to win just because of the language order. If we switched the language order, we might have been able to catch it. Or if we did something that didn't depend on coincidence to win, we also could have caught it. Um, so the moral of the story, favor explicit assertions over potential coincidence. Favor specs that tell the story you need to know. Beware of coincidental truths. 
Don't be overly uh, clever with your test fixtures. And our careers are founded on math, so learning more math is always good. I had questions planned, but don't ask them because I'm over time. Um, you can come find me in the hallway. I'm more than happy to like, discuss anything with you. Um, I'm Matt Machuga. If you want to find me on Twitter, GitHub, Freenode, just use my last name. I'm from a city called Erie, Pennsylvania. This is how our summers work. <laughs> It's really cold, but if you want to come up, we have a user group. Um, it's about once a month. It's called Code Erie. We have the Erie Day of Code Conference, which Taylor is gracious enough to sponsor every year. So thank you very much, Taylor. Um, TTM is hiring. If you want to work for a Ruby and JavaScript job, come talk to me. And if you need any consulting or teaching um, for testing, writing software, whatever, I'm for hire here. And thank you very much.